My name's Steve. I'm a father of three and a social entrepreneur. And uh, I coach executives and teams and help them with stress and uh, underperformance. My favorite part of my job yes. is working with different people. <laughs> That's what I love. All the different people that I work with. Meeting different people from different walks of life, different countries, different cultures. You know, doing different things with different experiences. Uh, I work with uh, charities, I work with large businesses, big corporates, I work with executive leaders, uh, I work with regular, quote unquote, regular people, all of it. Black or white? <laughs> Both. Probably black. <laughs> oh, neither. Opportunity. No, money. Opportunity every time. London. Yeah, London is the best city in the world, I have to say. It's the best city in the world, it really is. Is it true that you can leap over a chair from a standing position? It depends on the size of the chair. Uh, I'll cheat a little bit. Revolutionary new product for your iPod. Socks. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I want to give you, I want to do something totally off the wall. Elon Musk. <laughs> Those Merlin engines are fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Good idea for an electric jet. You do? Yeah. Then we'll make it work. I'm Batman. Oh, another tough one. Batman. Is the world flat? Are we crazy? <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> do you know this kind of conspiration term about the world is flat? Uh, the, yeah, the, the, there's a whole, uh, whole bunch of people that think the world is flat. Yeah, <laughs> it's... <laughs> so follow me, you could about to go. Ah! I'm doing 500, I'm out of control. Ah! Money, sex and power, all the same thing. So I think for me, the, the two things that are really evolving quickly with companies is technology and culture. Those are the two things. We're becoming global. Uh, we're becoming very similar around the world and we expect the same kind of products, the same kind of services in the same kind of way, but we're also expecting innovation, the pace of change. And at the same time, we're developing this global kind of consciousness around, you know, being socially aware. We're developing a cultural mindset around sustainability, around multi-generational thinking. And those are the two main things that I'm seeing in every company, whether it's a small company or a big company. And then you're asking for other things, a few other things. So culture, technology, those two things kind of go together. What I'm seeing is companies diverging around what I would call uh, body-based practices, being aware of the body. So some companies are understanding that we, we are a body, I don't just have a body and so it means that I need to take care of my body. I need to be healthy and I, I need to think clearly. I need to think clearly under pressure. And there's companies that don't care about the body, aren't interested in that, just see people as a commodity. And I think those are the companies that are gonna struggle in the future. Uh, so those are again, two more things, you know, companies that are thinking, thinking about people, thinking about, uh, what, what is creative, what is passion, you know, that's kind of interesting to me. Stress is an interesting thing, right? It's, uh, it happens to everybody and we perceive stress differently. So some people see stress as something positive and some other people can experience that same stressful event as something negative. And we all have good stress and bad stress. So I think the first thing is that we really need to get an understanding of what stress is to ourselves as individuals. And I think whether you're in a big company or whether you're in a small company, you're gonna be experiencing good and bad stress. It's really relative. Some people do well in a big company, some people do well in a small startup or you know, an entrepreneur setting. And I think that's, that's the first thing. How am I, how, how do I relate to stress? What is good stress and what's too much stress? So awareness is one of the key things that I teach and it's self-awareness. And it used to be that self-awareness was something that we'd only really reserve for 
maybe artists or you know kind of people that were uh, in a creative industry or maybe top athletes but now we're starting to see that a really deep sense of self-awareness is what is going to drive performance creativity it's going to drive uh, people working together better so Self-awareness, I think, is the number one thing that we can do, whether we're in a small company or a big company. Entrepreneurs are facing uh, a lot of change. You know, so adaptability, I think, is key. If, if you're an entrepreneur, it's going to be different every single day. You're under enormous deadlines, uh, you know, tight deadlines, high pressure, you want to deliver quickly, and you don't have that cushion, as you've said, in, in being an, in a big company. So you need to be adaptable. Uh, and again, that's something that comes from first a place of awareness and then learning how to manage your own state. So one of the things that we teach in Fit to Lead is how, like how to manage your state, literally. How do I notice how I am? How do I notice the stress that's going on around me? And how can I move into states that are optimal for me? Yeah, I think the third thing it was maybe one of the most important things <laughs> is we forget to have fun because we get we get really involved in what we're doing and we get narrow in our thinking and then we forget to have fun and if we're not having fun and there's no room to have fun then really what's the point of what we're doing right and fun again drives a sense of creativity of playfulness and you know I, I once uh, I started a business called lightning fast and uh, it's, I've gone through different iterations of that and I used to, I wanted my four letter acronym to be you know, focus, attitude, strategy, time, something like that and uh, eventually I thought you know, I'm just going to have the frameless framework and the first F has just got to be fun <laughs> and uh, there's a book by a guy called Sean Acor uh, called The Happiness Advantage and Sean talks about the fact that we always think that uh, happiness comes from success and success is interesting to define anyway. But the truth of the matter is that success comes from happiness. And that's a proven study that he's done. He spent a lot of time as a professor studying that. And he consults to companies all over the world teaching about happiness. So I think for all of us, we really need to catch a hold of what makes us happy. And if we don't do that, then you know, we're gonna get lost along the way. Oh, Elon Musk is interesting, right? Uh, a, he's a fellow South African, so that's gotta be good right there. And he's a very un unusual individual. I mean, he's exceptional. He's done so many different things. And, but you talk about stress, and I think, for me, he thinks about these really big things, like, you, you know, we need to get to the moon, or, but, but he, if you watch how he is, he's super playful. <laughs> you know, he, he really keeps that sense of fun and that sense of aliveness and I think that's one of the things that makes him so, so successful is because he just gives it a go. He's not afraid to fail. Uh, he, he treats even a big business like a startup. You know, he just goes for it and so I think we can take some, uh, you know, leaves out of his book. Again, he's really advanced in the way that he thinks. But uh, we go back to that thing about awareness. Uh, that I was talking about before. The other thing that we need to think about for ourselves, everybody should think about awareness and acceptance. So if we can't accept the way that things are, we can never change it. It's just, it's, we need to really be accepting what is here right now. So if you're a small time business entrepreneur and you, you've got big dreams, you know, keep in sense of that dream, keep in hold of that vision, keep in sense of fun, but also accepting reality and Okay, on, on one sense, we don't want to accept reality, especially if we're in a, a, a startup or we're doing something, because uh, the world is changed by people that nobody explained that it was impossible. You know, they just went out and did the impossible. And so I think going along with awareness and acceptance is attitude. And, uh, you know, when my boys were small, I would always tell them that attitude determines altitude. And so if you have a, a good attitude, a positive attitude, if you, if you can find a way to keep focusing yourself on you know, your goal your, and how you wanna be, then I think you're gonna learn how to mitigate your stress. In fact, I don't think you're gonna learn how to do that. You can absolutely learn how to manage your stress and manage your environment because you're focusing on the right things. I mean, look, he's, again, he's very intelligent, but if you take that out of the equation, if you, there's a lot of intelligent people like Elon that haven't made it. And again, I think he's thinking outside of the box. He looks at things creatively. 
And, and that I think is something that we all need to do, is we limit ourselves. So for example, for an entrepreneur that's starting, a single mother and she's you know, starting something locally, and, but it, it's something that she really wants to do here in Riga. Uh, being creative can, can take different forms. And when we move our bodies, when we get outside of what we're normally doing, one of the things I sometimes coach people to do, whether they're, again, if they're in a big corporate or they're small people, I get them to do really different things than they would normally do. Go stand on a desk, literally in the office, stand on a desk in the office. <laughs> it seems really ridiculous, right? But what you do is you change your perspective. Stand on a desk and you see your office in a way that you never saw it before. And and that changes a whole bunch of things in your chemistry and your physiology. It, you, your brain starts firing differently because you're seeing things differently. You're also moving your body. Uh, and if you do that with a sense of fun, you, you know, you might breathe, you might laugh, you might feel awkward. You'll find where your boundaries are. And then you'll relax. And what will happen is the chemicals that are associated with feeling good and uh, being creative will start to flow. And you'll probably come up with some really different ideas. If you don't want to stand on the desk because you're scared of heights or you don't want to hurt yourself or you know that I'm not advocating that you know go and stand on desks everyone I kind of am but take care of yourself go for a walk walk in a different place or pick up an instrument that you uh, haven't ever played before or if you've never played an instrument pick one up or learn a new sport learn something new that you can do with your body uh, and ideally something actually that's what we call a mindful practice. So something that is not just mindless, but something that you would need to pay attention to. And that's going to unleash some creativity for you. The number one thing for me around inspiration, I think, is people. You know, I love people. I enjoy talking to people. Uh, when you start to expand the circle of your thinking, you know, cultures, places, uh, foods, music, you know, styles of things that you haven't experienced before. It really sparks creativity for me. I enjoy that. And so, you know, I'm Greek, right? And I'm a Greek South African. So, so uh, here I am, you know, I don't eat until I'm full, I eat until I'm tired. <laughs> I always joke. But if you combine food and conversation, uh, for me, that's magic. You know, good food, good conversation around a table, uh, experiencing different things, uh, you know, that's, that's my number one place, I think, where I, I feel creativity flow, I feel hopeful, uh, I find that w when you really get around the table and you rest around food that you really enjoy with people that you're, uh, you know, having a good time with, then you start to feel differently about things and, uh, you know, that's, that's my number one thing. Movement is the other thing. Uh, I do yoga, uh, a lot of yoga, and you know various various different things, some martial arts, and but playing sports or getting out, going for a walk, walking in nature for me is huge. Uh, that's a, a very big thing. Or swimming, uh, I like to spend time in water. I know I'm in a creative agency, so I'm not just <laughs> selling creativity here, but uh, you know bringing our passion to what we do is so important. And I think so many people are stuck in dead end jobs that they don't like, making money to buy things that they don't need, to impress people they don't even want to be with. You know, don't spend your time with people you don't want to spend time with. Don't do things you don't want to do. Uh, learn how to find your yes and your no. Play around with it. Uh, start to figure out what what turns you on, you know, and you know we, we're we're so busy uh, you know, being scared of things, you know, trying to avoid things or secretly looking at things like you know sex, for example. We don't want to talk about sex, but everyone wants to have sex, pretty much everybody. Um, so why don't why aren't we talking about that? And and if we're not if we're not having sex or we're having bad sex, and we should stop or we should go and find what makes us you know feel good so that we can have good sex, right? It's the same with food. Why are we eating food that is just boring or that's not good for us? Uh, you know why are we not moving around physically, going to places and and following our passions? And so I think. For me, those people that you, you mentioned, Steve Jobs, you know, he put a ding in the universe because he was creative and he thought out the box, right? Bill Gates, again, I think he, he's super intelligent, but you'll probably find, I don't know the man, 
But if you look at some of his social projects and the things that, that he's doing, you know, let's, he's looked at things fairly creatively and, and looked at the numbers creatively. So he said, what's the number one thing that we need to solve right now? It's killing the most people, malaria. So my father-in-law died of malaria in Mozambique. So I took it, I, I, I really paid attention to what Bill Gates did there with the, um, you know, their foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates actually. So his wife is part of that. So we talk about Bill Gates, but then we see that it's a, it's a partnership, right? We, we, we don't just do things in isolation. And so that's kind of inspiring to me. And then, again, you know, if we, if we, if we look at something more local, so I met, uh, the, the woman who started the zero waste company in Riga. She's the first woman to have done that. Now, she's, she's a PhD, uh, I think in neurology. Uh, she went to Indonesia, she's done all these amazing things, but she's got a passion for really trying to change things. So she's, she's followed her passion. She's had a look at what really she thinks she wants to make a difference in, and then she's gone and pursued that and her cafe is amazing she's made things reclaimed the tables out of wood uh, you know she's bringing people in and she's really she's just uh, signed up to new door the uh, uh, startup accelerator the business accelerator to get some additional information so she's really going outside of herself to look for different ways of doing uh, what she wants to do you know we need something to hope in if without hope then people lose the will to live. Really, if you, if you don't have hope, you're, you, you, you get into a, a rut. And so we need to keep hope alive. And you've got to find what that looks like for you. And if, if you find that you're not hopeful, then you need to go and have a conversation with yourself. <laughs> and the, there's ultimately, there's one person that you're with from cradle to grave, beginning to end, and that's yourself. And so we need to take responsibility for that. And I think people that, that really take responsibility for finding their own hope, hanging on to their own hope and pushing forward are the people that, that really make it and then give hope and inspiration to other people. And so for me, that's uh, you know, what, uh, what happened in South Africa. And you know, my inspiration in South Africa is Nelson Mandela. So I grew up in apartheid South Africa and I didn't know what I didn't know. I really had no idea until I came to the UK. I was in, I was 21. Uh, I happened very uh, thankfully to have a British passport. So my father fought in the uh, Royal Navy during the Second World War. So he, he was a British citizen. So that's a little bit of luck, right? And uh, for me, and I think England's a phenomenal country. So I've, I've lived in England for more than half my life now. So. Now I'm this Greek South African who was married to an American at one point and uh, all my kids were born in the UK and I've lived in the UK. So I'm really a scrambled omelette mix of different things. And I didn't know what I did know, I was ignorant. And as I started to talk to people, which is one of the things that I said I like to do and listening to people's point of view, I started to slowly, slowly learn new things and come to an awareness of well, the way that I saw things wasn't actually true. And that also took a little bit of courage, I think. There's, a, there's this conversation that we ha have to have about courage and having courageous conversations. I think that's uh, something that gives people hope. If we're courageous, then we inspire people around us. And, and one of the things uh, I think that, that really sparks uh, a courageous conversation is kindness. You know, we, we all have a chance to be kind every day. And I can be a real dick sometimes, you know, I really. I, I, just like everybody, I suppose. I get stuck in what I'm doing, I'm so focused, and I don't pay attention to people. And so for me, I, I keep constantly trying to come back to finding ways to listen, finding ways to review, how did I do there? Is, am I happy with that? <laughs> Yeah, you know, honestly, is this the person that I want to be? Is this how I want to be? And I keep refining that and going back to inspirations like Nelson Mandela. And as I find people that give me inspiration, so I read his book, The Long Walk to Freedom, and it's one of the best books I've ever read. Now, other people might not think that, or, you know, I grew up, my parents thought that he was a terrorist, right? And in some senses, he was. But anarchy, 
you know, d rebellion, the right to dissent, the right to think, the right to freely express ourselves. These are hard-won freedoms that uh, we need to hang on to. And I guess that leads to respect. You know, we need to, we need to learn some respect. And I think people who don't know how to respect, sooner or later they get the teeth knocked out of them. You know, they find themselves on the floor. And uh, if, they're, if they're willing to learn, then, you know, you can harness something different if, if we, and, and then that takes humility. So we've got all these big words going on, humility, respect, you know, courage, kindness. I, you know, I'm kind of melancholy when it comes to songs, I suppose. Uh, maybe, <laughs> I don't know why, but you talk about freedom and I think about you two's, uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But, it, you know, for me, it's a happy song because there's this wistful hope, hopefulness in that song. You know, I write poetry as well and uh, I like David, David White's poems. Uh, so, so there's something about this being really authentic and honest about where you are that can give you hope uh, you know during the dark times and yeah there's just something about I think the way that you two put those lyrics and, and melodies together uh, they're not my favorite band but that particular song I think feels hopeful to me and uh, yeah, that, that would be my song. Yeah, I think for me, from a, when you're choosing a startup or you're looking at a startup or you're starting a startup, uh, there's going to be three things really that are critical. One is the people. So it's, the, it's all about leadership. It's all about the people that you've got around you. But it's, it's an, one person is not enough or a few people is not enough. You need to be able to build a team of people around you. So when you're looking at investing in a startup, it's got to be sustainable. So it can't just be reliant on one person that's going to leave and disappear. And that's got to have the second pillar or the second leg of the stool, which is that product or service, leaning on technology, leaning on innovation, you know, that's got to be, uh, it's got to be robust and leading edge at the same time. Uh, and then the third thing for me is really around execution. So you, you can have really good people and you can have a really good idea, really good products and service. You've got the best technology, you've got the right investment, uh, but you don't know how to execute or you, you just don't execute uh, or you're not focused on execution, then you're gonna end up failing. But I think if you can get the right people focused around the right idea uh, with the right technology and, and, and business operations executing, then you're gonna be successful. And I've been in technology for over 25 years, uh, selling technology, using technology, consuming technology. I'm pretty opinionated about it. And, and also in terms of culture, community and social activity, you know, be, social enterprise, uh, again, something that I love. So actually I'm doing a project called Conversations with Steve. I want to have conversations with people about movement, meditation, mindfulness and breath. So it's really the body-based, mind-based, body-mind connection and that spirit and soul, you know, how do we feel? And then uh, business, technology, um, community and culture on that side. So I like to talk about those things. So for me, those eight subjects which are in two big themes are super important and different people have different ideas so technology is really bad we're losing our sense of connection i'm not sure how true that is you know facebook is actually in some ways bringing us together uh, there's and there'll be something else and we like to interact on the other side you're right we're we stop moving, we, we're hunched over. So we actually go into physiologically stress response because we're sitting down and we're hunched over and we tilt our heads forward. So what starts to happen is we get stressed and we don't understand what's happening to our bodies. Uh, teenagers now, their bones are soft, they're not fully developed and they're starting to have uh, issues in their upper spine. So we're starting to see actual uh, technology-based injuries that are, are coming about. So there's a bit of a balance, right? And, and yes, we can feel very isolated. So there's a lot of science as well around feeling isolated because we're seeing people that seem to be happy. Everyone's happy on Instagram, right? And, 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 it's, and we know it's not true. And we get addicted to our technology as well. I, I think one of the things we tend to do as, as human beings is we polarize things. We, it's black or it's white. 
uh, you know, it's this or it's that. And it's binary thinking and it's very limited thinking. And the world just isn't like that. It, it, the world is, you know, all kinds of black and white and gray and all the hues in between. And then all of a sudden there's an explosion from the rainbow of all kinds of different colors. And then there's all the things we can't see. And for me, technology is the same way. One of the things I'm also seeing with technology is we're integrating with technology. So we're scared of it. My mother's generation uh, were brought up with the Bible. I was taught that the Antichrist is coming, Armageddon is coming, you know, uh, technology will 666, the mark of the beast, you know, we're all going to be in trouble. And I guess I kind of feel that it, the, the beast is always here and kind of we are the beast, right? We, we keep reimagining the beast and bringing it to life. And and, you know, we're, we're enhancing ourselves with technology. I mean, the phones are really already an extension of who we are. They've become part of who we are. But even if we go a little bit more subtle, if we have embedded technology, like a, a pacemaker or an ear implant, then we're actually cyborgs. And the definition of a cyborg is somebody who is merged with technology, somebody that is a, not fully human, quote unquote. So we're, we're using technology every, every day, becoming a part of technology, and I think that that pace of change is going to increase. I, I genuinely think that we're pretty much the last few generations of free-range humans. My grandkids maybe, my great-grandkids maybe, but I think probably my grandkids will be the last kind of of the free-range humans. And we're going to arrive at a point where uh, AI will become self-aware, that's going to happen and the technology is going to be looking at us as human beings and evaluating us and saying you know you're kind of messing up the planet you're, you're unhealthy you're destroying yourselves and it'll think faster than us and we so we're faced at a uh, we're faced with a very interesting moment in time and the domain of humans i think is going to be creativity <laughs> it's going to be uh, being human you know, I've, I've got a, a watch on that is, is a Swiss engineered watch, it's mechanical. And something really interesting about that is when something's mechanically engineered, it can only be, you know, 98, 99% efficient. It, it can't be 100% efficient. And there's something about organic, natural ways of doing things that is beautiful. And I think in the future, the technology is going to be coming to us and saying, what does it feel like to be human? What does it <laughs> tell us? What is it like to feel? What is it? Tell us about creativity. How do you feel about music? And so I think being scared of technology is a mistake. And I think overly relying on technology is a mistake. Finding the balance, I think, is what's important and remembering how to feel. Uh, one of the things I do in my job every single day is I ask people how they feel. How are you? How do you want to be? How do you feel? You'll find me asking that question a lot. How do you feel? How do you feel about that? And what's really surprising with that question, people don't know. <laughs> people have completely lost touch with their feelings. They don't know how they feel. It's a, a shocking thing. Generally, it's, yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. And Latvia, you know, people are quite closed. I did a workshop uh, this weekend and Latvians tend to be a little bit more insular, they don't answer questions easily, you know, they're a little bit more shy. But one of the exercises, I do a lot of exercises where I get people doing things and it's to turn, find a partner, somebody that you haven't spoken to and debrief about what we just did. And so they start having a conversation and they didn't stop talking. <laughs> the, I think this excitement of talking to somebody new in a safe environment where we can really express ourselves it was really great to watch people coming out of, out of themselves and thinking about how they were feeling uh, i think that's really cool well, i had a boss once who said i, I never worry about things i can't change <laughs> and I, I guess it's, it's kind of true right we we shouldn't worry about those things but we shouldn't also sit back and say well i can't change that or that's not my job uh, we also spend a lot of time saying, well, that's not my job, that's not my job, that's not my job. Uh, and really what we're doing is we're walking around 
on the planet and we're saying somebody should do that and oh, somebody should do that and somebody should fix that and somebody should think about that and then if we're really paying attention we're going to realize that we are that somebody and one of the things we can do is get together in groups have conversations uh, one of my very good friends Andy Pace in London works with uh, the democracy of open forums. So he starts to get people together and he calls it the voice of the community. And as a community, we have a really strong voice and we need to go to our politicians who also have kids, who also have uh, vested interest in things going well and not having the planet destroyed by technology. And we need to look at laws and policies that can help us to start to regulate the way that we're deploying technology. I think it is fairly dangerous. Uh, again, we've talked about Elon Musk. He says, one of my favorite interviews, somebody asked him about AI and the machines, and he said, don't kick the machines, don't do it. Don't be angry, don't, just, yep, don't do it. And he knows, right, that those, as you said, those machines are gonna, those machines are gonna learn, they're gonna start becoming self-aware, and there's a big difference between AI and machine learning, but those two things will also start to converge. And what, what we can do is, is be curious, ask questions, start thinking in, in collaboration with other people. And, but again, I do think that there's hope and there's nothing new under the sun, right? Thousands of years ago, uh, there's a very old book that uh, that talks about that and, and says that really there's nothing new under the sun and what we're just learning is how to do dumb things even quicker <laughs> with technology and if we go forward 10,000 years from now you said how's it going to look in 20 years well how's it going to look in 10,000 years 100,000 years a million years 10 million years you know we're a we're a blip and so what we can do is be really present in the moment and make really good choices in the moment. Talk to people, think about how we're feeling, think about what really makes a difference and not say that's somebody else's job. It's all of our jobs to be thinking about being kind. And I, I do think that the machines and technology are giving rise to a different type of consciousness. So th there's this, yeah, and it sounds weird, it, sound, it used to be something that was only talked about in, you know, in crazy circles, people taking drugs, the hippies, uh, you know, now the corporate hippies are starting to pay attention, but there is a, a, a raising of consciousness that's happening, and we can be a part of that conversation, and so the hope is, I spoke about hope earlier, that we'll stay playful, we'll stay curious, we'll stay passionate, we'll learn how to be kind, we'll keep learning that. The machines will evolve alongside us and then they'll see who's trying, who's not, <laughs> and we'll collaborate with them and, and then we'll have, we'll have a shot at them figuring out what it is to be human. A friend of mine uh, wrote a book called Still Human and it's a, it's a book about business and it's a really great book. It's a, he's a South African again, Brad Shawkind and Andy Golding. There's two of them actually that wrote this book. Uh, still human. And we have ways, that's the domain of us. That's the thing that makes us unique. And I think if we catch a hold of that and we stay human and we think about what it is to be human, then we can celebrate that. We won't be the quickest, we won't be the fastest, we won't be the smartest. Uh, so we can be the most human, which means appreciation, gratitude, having fun, staying creative, staying playful, staying energetic, uh, you know, showing up our, as our best selves. And I think that's the best future that's possible and that's the future that I'm aiming at and hoping for. We're going to constantly move between centralization and decentralization. That happens in every industry, in every technology, you know, we, we and in the laws of the universe, expansion and contraction. It happens in our bodies, it happens in our relationships. You know, we're born, we grow old, we die. You know, expansion and contraction, cycles of life, movement towards life and death. So the best thing that we can do is follow those cycles, move with those cycles. We can follow nature, and then we can follow the cycles that are gonna happen with things like blockchain, that centralization, uh, the internet, 
consolidated things, brought together information, and blockchain is a, the next big technology that's going to do a lot of those things for us. And I think it'll help us democratize things. The number one thing that we can really hang on to is information, freedom of information, uh, and making sure that we're not overly governed. So there needs to be some governance, but we again need to catch a hold of what freedom is. And, and you're right, people want to be free. I don't think people really understand what freedom is. They don't understand it. And our freedoms are hard fought for, hard won things. You know, my father, as I said, was in the Second World War. I mean, they, we can say who won the war. Nobody won the war, everybody lost. <laughs> it was, it's terrible. If the machines rise up and it becomes like Terminator, then everyone's going to lose. There'll be death and destruction. So what we can do is be human, follow the, the cycles, follow the patterns, be forward thinking, embrace technologies as much as we can embrace while simultaneously embracing being human. And I think being hopeful, you know, I think there's, there's two kinds of people in the world. Uh, those who can count and, you know, no, kidding. <laughs> Let me go back. There's actually, there's three kinds of people in the world. Those who can count and those who can't. That's how that joke's supposed to go. Uh, there, there are, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people that live in this terrible, dark, cold, angry world where it's full of hatred and people are against them and it's hopeless and it's, it's a really bad, angry, awful world. And then there's people that live in a world that's exciting and hopeful and full of possibility and it's passionate and it's creative and there's something happening. And you know, those people both live in the same world, right? Same world, it's just how we look at things and we see things through our feelings. That's how we see the world. So you can be the kind of person that things happen to, or you can be the kind of person that goes out and happens to things. And that's the kind of people that we need to be. We need to go out and be passionate, be creative, figure out what we love and get on with it. <laughs> what did I say to myself 20 years ago? Invest in Google. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, I think 20 years ago, if I, if I look back, one of the defining moments in my life was I was in my early 30s, I was a director, I was young, so I was very young. They, they said to me, you know, Steve, do you realize that people work their entire lives to become a director in a company like this? And, and you know, you've done it at, at 35. And, but I was, I was tired, I was unhappy, I was unhealthy, uh, I was, I was being my passionate self, the self that you see now, but I was slowing down and I was becoming unhealthy. And the number one thing that I would say to myself, which is the same thing that I would say to, to young people, is look after your health. Don't sacrifice your health for wealth. It's not worth it because what we do is we spend our time uh, making money and, and making wealth and then we spend our wealth and our money trying to get back our health. So you don't have to do that. And again, one of the things that my business partner Celine and I do is we teach people how to focus on the now, be in the present, be happy, be balanced, be creative, have fun, uh, and don't sacrifice your health for wealth. I think that's the number one thing that I would say to people. That's so hard to choose, right? I, right now, I'm listening to uh, an audiobook, Stephen Kotler's Stealing Fire. Fantastic book, I'd highly recommend that. We talk about flow states, we talk about uh, you know, heightened ways of being. I think that's a fantastic book, uh, really. Tim Ferriss, I like a lot of his stuff. Tools of Titans, there's a story in Tools of Titans about uh, guys that failed warm up. And uh, it's going back to the basics. I, I really like his work. The 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader by John Maxwell. It's a simple book, really easy read. And uh, I think for me that, you know, 21 Indispensable, <clears throat> 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader by John Maxwell is a book that is short, simple, and really has skills that we can learn as leaders. And as people that want to, you know, be the best version of ourselves, I think that's a great book. It's really influenced me. There's a really great book uh, and a person, Daniel Ingram, 
Uh, so I would check out his podcast if you're into meditation and mindfulness. It's probably the best book I've ever read on meditation. It's hard going. Uh, it's called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. It's not about Buddhism, it's about meditation. He happens to look at meditation through that lens. Uh, and, and actually there's another one that's um, The Mind Illuminated by Kula Desa that those two books kind of go hand in hand. And I think finding a meditative, contemplative state is, is really important. Uh, and then if I had to give a shout out to somebody, Richard Raw. He's one of the directors of the Center for Action and Contemplation. And Richard Raw talks about the Enneagram, which is something that I love. And he's a Franciscan monk. And he just has all of this wisdom in this wonderful way of being uh, and living a contemplative lifestyle. So I think that's a nice balance between performance and just being human. Okay, so I'm in Riga uh, for a number of reasons, but my main reason I came to Riga by invitation from New Door, which is an uh, uh, incubator, business ex accelerator, and working with startups and entrepreneurs. And New Door are a really exciting NGO, um, but they work with social enterprise. And that's exciting for me because, as I said, I think. Uh, social business is the is the the next big wave of things that we need to do to make a difference in the world and uh, the British Council Latvia sponsored them so I'm very grateful to them to uh, to have invited me and to come and share a bit of myself with some of these entrepreneurs that are, are starting social enterprises which is probably the, the most difficult place to do uh, a startup so that's it and then I'm working with other leaders and teams and businesses uh, uh, promoting Fit to Lead, which is uh, my business with my partner, Celine, and we again work with coaches and leaders around the world. We train trainers and we help people to, to stay healthy, uh, to be better versions of themselves. Uh, we use techniques like uh, heart coherence from heart math. To, and th these are really scientific ways of looking at our state of being. And uh, and then we can regulate our state. So we, we teach that to businesses and business leaders to help them uh, succeed and help their team succeed. What I think about the agency Tribe, it's such a cool place. Tribe is uh, exciting. You guys are friendly, you showed me around. I think the artwork is amazing. I love the fact that you know, you're friendly and creative and um, passionate clearly about what you do. and. Uh, I'm really grateful to be uh, to be invited to be speaking at Tribe, yeah. If we can be kind to one another, then we're going to go a long way. And I, I, it's, it's, kindness has so many things in it because when we're kind, we learn how to listen. And I think that's the thing that we're, we're missing in the world and if we if we just capture a sense of kindness and it's something that I keep learning every day yeah. again I can be a dick <laughs> I know it I try not to be uh, but sometimes I, I just uh, you know I'm so doing what I'm doing but if we can be kind if we can listen then I think the world's going to be a better place <laughs>